My only visit to India was in January 2013. This two-week group trip was organized by Go Ahead. I had wanted to visit India ever since I was a student and had fallen under the spell of Hermann Hesse's novel Siddhartha. His parents and grandparents had done missionary work in India, but his romantic portrayal of the country has little to do with the reality of India that I encountered on the first day of our trip. Three striking aspects of India are immediately apparent and impossible to ignore. The poverty, the pollution, and the huge masses of people everywhere. It took a while before I could simply accept the grinding poverty, the pollution, and the massive population. India is a country of stunning natural beauty with exquisite cultural monuments and colorfully dressed, hardworking people. Street children were not simply begging as in other countries, but here youngsters were working hard and engaged in well-rehearsed performances for the tourist crowd. Watching them work so hard for so little return could be gut-wrenching. I was struck by the many thousands of people buying and selling books, clothes, electronics, and just about everything from the makeshift markets set up on the sidewalk. With its population approaching 1.4 billion, India will soon surpass China as the world's most populous nation. Delhi is one of the oldest cities in the world and has been continuously inhabited for the past 2,500 years. India's capital, New Delhi, is not a separate city but rather one of the 11 districts that comprise the city of Delhi, whose population is now over 16 million. Another 10 million people live in the metropolitan areas surrounding Delhi. India's version of George Washington is Mahatma Gandhi. He is widely revered as the father of the independent Republic of India, which was established in 1950, two years after Gandhi was assassinated. One of our first stops in Delhi was to Gandhi's memorial and museum. The Red Fort was the main residence of the Mughal emperors. For over 300 years, from the 16th to the 19th century, this Persian-speaking Muslim dynasty ruled the vast Mughal Empire that included most of modern India, Pakistan, Afghanistan, and Bangladesh. We spent most of the day exploring the many structures still standing inside the walls of the Red Fort, India's largest historic site. Construction of this 250-acre complex was commissioned in 1638 by Emperor Shah Jahan when he decided to move the Mughal capital from Agra to Delhi. The emperor named the new capital after himself, Shah Jahanabad. At its peak, the Mughal Empire had the world's largest economy and contained a quarter of the world's population while the richest 655 families enjoyed fabulous wealth most of the empire's 120 million inhabitants lived in abject poverty in the 18th century the empire began to break up as a result of foreign invasions and internal strife among the afghans sikhs and marathas a hindu confederacy the last mughal emperor was deposed by the British in 1858. For the next 90 years, India remained a colonial economy under British crown rule. It was always jarring to go from viewing the splendid monuments of Mughal elites to the abject poverty and squalor of homeless people today. The tomb of Humayun, the second Mughal emperor, was commissioned by his wife in 1538. The 40-year-old ruler had the misfortune to trip and fall on the slippery steps in his palace. The Persian architects designed the first garden tomb on the Indian subcontinent using red sandstone on a scale never seen before. This graceful minaret is an example of early Afghan architecture and marks the beginning of Muslim rule in India 
at the end of the 12th century. It's part of the Qutb Minar complex, which includes the first mosque built in Delhi and one of the oldest mosques in all of India. It was built atop a previous religious site using the recycled remains of 27 Hindu and Jain temples that once stood here. This important historic site includes some 40 historic monuments from various periods, most notably a ceremonial gate and some VIP tombs. The site is popular among foreigners as well as locals. I spotted a chipmunk who reminded me of the street children performing for a meager handout, in contrast to the well-heeled Indians and their families. Bangla Sahib is one of the oldest Gurudwara, a Sikh house of worship. Founded in 1664, the Gurudwara has been periodically expanded, with the current structure having been built in the 20th century. As in all Gurudwaras, this one provides a free meal to people of any faith. The kitchen is staffed by Sikh volunteers. The site also contains a school, a museum, a hospital, a library, and a large holy pond. The eighth Sikh guru stayed here during smallpox and cholera epidemics in the 17th century. He helped alleviate the suffering by giving out fresh water from the holy river inside the complex, the Sarabar. The water is now revered as having supernatural healing powers and is taken back to their homes by Sikhs from around the world. Akbar I planned his own mausoleum. Its design and construction was begun before the great emperor's death and completed in 1613 by his son. The site takes up more than a hundred acres at the outskirts of Agra, the former Indian capital city. This beautiful red sandstone and white marble tomb contains the remains of some of his daughters and other family members. The Taj Mahal is widely recognized as one of the most beautiful and famous buildings in the whole world. The white marble mausoleum was commissioned in 1632 by Mughal Emperor Shah Jahan for his favorite wife, who died while giving birth to her 14th child. The emperor himself is also buried here. Agra is known for its many fine ceramics and pottery studios. It's estimated that over 5 million stray cows roam freely throughout major cities, blocking traffic in small villages and destroying fields in the countryside. Hindus make up 80% of India's population. Many are vegetarians and those who do eat meat will almost never eat beef. Divinity is believed to be inherent in all living things. The cow is widely revered as a caretaker and maternal figure. Hindus consider the zebu, an Indian species of humped cattle, to be sacred. Some states ban the slaughter of cattle completely. Some have no restrictions at all, and others limit the slaughter based on the animal's age, gender, and the ability to produce milk. Farmers often turn their unproductive cows loose when they can no longer afford to feed them. Many cows end up dying in one of the country's several thousand official cow shelters. Bicycles are a popular and cheap form of transportation here, as in many other countries. They are often faster than traveling by car or bus, which can be a nightmare in heavily congested traffic. We once got stuck in an intersection from which it took us about 20 minutes and the help of friendly pedestrians to free our bus from gridlock. Indians drive on the left side of the road a vestige of their British colonial past. Truck drivers often play a game of chicken, barreling down the center of the road 
and swerving off to the left at the very last moment. Fruit stands and other forms of roadside commerce are everywhere. The city of Fatehpur Sikri was founded as the capital of the Mughal Empire by Emperor Akbar in 1571. Among the more unusual structures here is the Panch Mahal, a five-story palace which probably housed some of Akbar's many wives and concubines. One of the first structures built here was the main congregational mosque, one of the largest in India. The entire palace city is surrounded by a three-mile-long wall. Our tour bus drove us to the city of Bharatpur. There, we would take a train to a national park where I was hoping to see some wild tigers. The train station was crowded with passengers and even some free roaming cattle. India's railway system is the fourth largest in the world, annually transporting close to 10 billion people. On our trip, we got to chat with Indians who were eager to engage us in conversation. Our spacious hotel was located just outside Ranthambhor National Park in the state of Rajasthan. What began as a small nature sanctuary in 1955 steadily expanded to become a major national park in 1980. Today it extends over an area of some 500 square miles. The park contains dry deciduous forests and open grassy meadows with almost 600 species of flowering plants. In 1973, the Indian government under Indira Gandhi included the sanctuary as part of Project Tiger. This is a national program to ensure a viable population of Bengal tigers and protect them from extinction. In addition to tigers, the wildlife here includes crocodiles, wild boar, spotted deer, striped hyenas, sloth bears, and lots of rhesus macaque monkeys. We were lucky to spot one of the 48 tigers living in the park. Machli, dubbed the Lady of the Lakes, was the world's oldest living tigress when she died a few years later in 2016 at the age of 20. Most buses here are a lot older than our modern tour bus. Older still is the use of cow dung as a cheap, renewable source of fuel for heating and cooking. Ever since prehistoric times, feces from cattle have been molded by hand into round dung cakes. These are dried in the sun and then stored in piles. Some of the local kids wanted to practice their English with me, asking about America and talking about their dreams for the future. Jaipur is the capital of Rajasthan and its largest city with over 3 million inhabitants. The Jantar Mantar is an 18th century collection of astronomical instruments made of stone, including the world's largest sundial. The city palace dates from 1727, when the Maharaja moved his capital seven miles from Amber here to Jaipur, one of the country's first planned cities. The Jaipur royal family continues to have a residence here. The five-foot-tall urns are the largest silver vessels in the world, produced from 14,000 melted silver coins. They were made so the Maharaja could take water from the Ganges River to drink on his trip to England in 1902. Today, Jaipur is known as the Pink City, but it wasn't originally this color. The Maharaja ordered the entire city to be painted pink in order to impress the British Prince Albert during his 1876 tour of India. Even today, it's illegal to paint buildings here any other color but pink. Katak is a form of traditional Indian classical dance. 
Here the dancers tell a story with their whole bodies, focusing on rhythmic foot and hand movements. Also important are subtle facial expressions, especially of the eyes and eyebrows. After dinner, we came across a huge wedding procession, stretching for many blocks down the avenue. This was certainly a lavish affair, complete with multiple marching bands, horses, camels, and elephants. Some in our tour group eagerly joined the celebration and started dancing in the street. Indians spend a fortune on their weddings, which normally take place over the span of three days. The average cost of a middle-class Indian wedding ranges from about $6,000 to over $600,000. They typically spend about one-fifth of their total lifetime wealth on one wedding. The city of Amber and its hilltop Amber Fort were originally built during the reign of Raja Alan Singh Mina in the 10th century. Our tour group enjoyed the bumpy elephant ride up the side of the hill. Animal rights groups have recently criticized this practice as being inhumane and abusive to the elephants. The fortress and palace complex were completely rebuilt in the 17th century using marble and sandstone. The intricately decorated Ganesh Gate is the main entrance to the Maharaja's private palace. It's named after the Hindu god Lord Ganesh, who is said to remove all obstacles in life. The palace is constructed on four levels, each with its own courtyard. The Maharaja's private quarters are thus separated from buildings used for public and private audiences and those housing his bodyguards. The courtyards are embellished with beautifully crafted mosaics and sculptured decorations, some with embossed silver artwork. Jaigar Fort is located on an even higher hill overlooking Amber Fort. It was built in 1726 to protect Amber Fort and its important palace complex. Maota Lake provides essential water to the fort. Built into the lake is a saffron garden supposedly planted by the Maharaja himself back in the 15th century. One of the more fascinating places we visited was a company where we observed the workers making handcrafted textiles and rugs. Weaving probably dates back to the Stone Age and has been practiced in all major civilizations around the world for many thousands of years. The main centers for carpet making in India are in Jaipur, Agra and the other northern cities. The place we visited produced textiles with handsome block prints as well as woven carpets. Indian carpet weavers learned from those in Turkey and Persia. I was amazed to see how both water and fire are used toward the end of the manufacturing process. As a souvenir, I got a block print of an elephant stamped on the back of my travel vest. From Jaipur in northern India, we flew to the southern city of Kochi, formerly known in English as Cochin. On our first night there, we attended a performance of Katakali, a classical Indian dance form. This traditional dance, performed only by male actors playing both men's and women's roles, is kind of a story play. The performances are marked by elaborate makeup, costumes, and face masks. The Japanese No and Kabuki traditions similarly have dance-based performances with highly stylized male dancers in elaborate costumes and makeup. The state of Kerala is one of the chief producers of fish in India. Over a million people here earn their living through fishing and related activities such as drying, processing and packaging. The St. Francis Church, one of the oldest European churches in India, was built by the Portuguese over 500 years ago. The Dutch captured the territory 160 years later and held onto it for over a century. 
Finally, the British took possession at the end of the 18th century until India's independence 150 years later. Kerala has the lowest population growth of any Indian state, along with the highest literacy rate of 96%. It is also one of the most highly urbanized regions. A political coalition dominated by the Communist Party of India, Marxist, has governed Kerala for most of the past four decades. Everywhere we saw lots of children, especially girls, on their way to and from school. St. Mary's Basilica has been rebuilt many times since it was originally established in 427. Coconuts have been an important product here for centuries. They are used both for food and for the fiber from the outer husk called coir, which is widely used for making rope, mats, and other floor coverings. Diversity in India, the world's second most populous country after China, extends from people's physical appearance to the dozens of languages they speak and the different beliefs they profess. India is the birthplace of four major religions, Hinduism, Buddhism, Jainism, and Sikhism. 80% of India's population, over 1 billion people, are Hindus. Hinduism is one of the world's oldest religions, dating back more than 3,000 years. This religion is itself quite diverse, with no absolute religious authorities, no governing body, no prophet or any binding holy book. Hindus can choose to be monotheistic, polytheistic, agnostic, humanist, or even atheistic. Major faith and lifestyle issues such as vegetarianism, nonviolence, belief in rebirth, and adherence to the caste system are subjects of debate and not set in dogma. One of the best and most unforgettable experiences came toward the end of our trip, when we boarded a houseboat and cruised down the Kerala backwaters. We spent one night on the boat, relaxing, enjoying the stunning scenery, and reflecting on what we had learned over the past 10 days. Since gaining its independence from Britain 75 years ago, India has become the world's largest democracy. While many old physical and social structures still remain, a large urban middle class has transformed India into one of the world's fastest growing economies. It's a country of such vastness and diversity that one visit barely scratched the surface. I'm looking forward to someday returning to India and experiencing more of this fascinating country.